Good evening, everybody. This is a meeting of the Planning and Development Management Committee of Trafford Council. Apologies for the delayed start. You'll probably see behind me we've got some technical difficulties. We're going to make a start and we're going to um, take some of the applications to develop. Um, out. So before we um, before we get started, can I just check, is Mr. Bulmer here? Any chance? Yeah, thank you. And is uh, Jenka Kaslik here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we'll take that. We'll take that item first once we get to the applications. Okay. So um, my name's Councillor Ben Hartley. I'm the chair of the committee. On my immediate right is Councillor Barry Wynne Stanley, who's the vice chair of the committee. On our left and right are officers from the council's planning, legal, and highways team who are here to advise the committee. Down the tables uh, along the side are local councillors who are members of the committee, and I'll introduce those people by name when they wish to speak. Before we uh, get started with the agenda, can I just check, is anybody planning to film any part of the meeting this evening? You could indicate now if you are. No? Okay, thank you. So the meeting is, is being filmed and it's being live streamed on the council's YouTube channel, and a recording of the meeting will be available to view for a time afterwards as well. Um, we'll start with um, item one agenda, which is attendances and apologies for absence. So we've had apologies from Councillor Walsh, uh, and there's no substitute for him. I don't think we've had any other apologies. It looks like everybody else is, is present. So we'll move on to item number two, which is declarations of interest. So this is members to give notice of any personal or prejudicial interest and the nature of that interest relating to any item on the agenda uh, in accordance with the adopted code of conduct. Any, are there any members looking to make a declaration of interest, please? Councillor Wynne Stanley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll be recusing myself for the 26 Herbston uh, Lane application. This is my family dentist. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wynne Stanley. Any other members looking to declare any interest? No. Okay, thank you. Item number three is the minutes, so it's to receive and, if so, agreed to approve as a correct record the minutes of the last meeting that was held on the 9th of February uh, 2023. Um, just looking for a member to move those because I wasn't here. Councillor Thomas, uh, Councillor Wynne Stanley, happy to second that? Second, yeah. Thank you. So those minutes are um, approved as a correct record of that last meeting. Item number four is questions from members of the public. So we have a maximum of 15 minutes allocated to any public questions submitted uh, to Democratic Services by 4 p.m. on the working day prior to the meeting. Questions must be within the remit of the committee or be relevant to items appearing on the agenda. Uh, and will be submitted in the order received, but we've had uh, no questions submitted for this meeting. Item number five is the additional information report. Um, so copies uh, are available in the room and copies are emailed to members of the committee earlier on today, and we'll consider the information in that report as we look at each of the applications. So turning now to uh, item number six, applications for permission to develop. Um, just by way of explanation for the applications, the process that will follow uh, is as follows. First of all, we'll have a presentation from a member of the planning team. We then may have speakers both against and for an item. Each speaker will be allowed three minutes and we will time the contributions. Um, and I will give you a warning when you're um, at the end of your time. Uh, we have local councillors who are here to speak. Local councillors get up to five minutes to speak on, on any item. When we've heard from um, any speakers against and for uh, the item, then members of the committee will start to discuss the item. I'll have introduced them when they wish to make a contribution. And we do need to take a vote on each item. So you'll see us taking a vote. And we may have a number of votes on certain applications, depending on what happens. So with that, we'll move turn to the first application. Uh, and we first of all, we're going to consider uh, application 109 463, which is the land at Freshfields Ferry Lane in Sale. Members of the committee, that starts on page 45 of your bundle, and we'll have an introduction um, from uh, Ms. Lowe's. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Apologies that there'll be no visuals um, with this presentation. Um, this is the application at the land at Freshfields on Ferry Lane in Sale, and the application is for a proposed energy reserve facility comprising of battery, energy storage system, and ancillary infrastructure. 
The application site is an open grass paddock in equestrian use within the designated green belt. The area is characterised as an urban fringe location and is located to the eastern edge of the Trafford Borough. The site is adjacent to the existing sorry, existing South Manchester substation to the northwest, another energy reserve facility, which is currently under construction, also to the northeast, electricity pylons and other energy infrastructure, along with telecommunications um, infrastructure, and the M60 motorway is to the south of the site, and the Metrolink runs adjacent to the southern boundary. So the Planning Commission has sought for the construction of a battery energy storage system with a capacity of 99.9 .9 megawatts. These are systems that enable renewable energy to be stored when supply is high, higher than demand, and released when there are surges in this demand. There are 48 pairs of battery units would be laid out across the site, and ancillary structures including small buildings, a substation and landscaping works are also proposed, as well as an acoustic fence on, the north, on part of the north and eastern boundaries. This application is reported to committee as there are more than six representations have been received contrary to the officer recommendation. These representations predominantly cite the construction impacts on the surrounding highway network of the development and assumed fire risk and the impact on residential amenity. These concerns have been considered and addressed in the officer report to committee and it is considered that these can be dealt with by suitably worded conditions. The proposal would constitute inappropriate development in the green belt, which is by definition harmful to the green belt and should only be approved in very special circumstances. Additional harm is also demonstrated to the openness of the green belt and some encroachment into the countryside. There has been some identified harm to visual amenity and temporary limited harm to residential amenity through some disturbance during the construction phase. The introduction of additional landscaping has been sought throughout the application process and includes the introduction of a planted landscape bund and hedgerows on the north and eastern boundaries adjacent to the 3.5 metre high acoustic fence as a way to help screen and improve the appearance of this part of the development. There are significant considerations in favour of this proposal that hold very significant weight. The proposal would significantly contribute to the local, regional and national efforts to reduce the reliance on fossil fuels, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and tackle climate change. The development incorporates innovative technology to enable the wider and effective application of renewable energy. It would also increase reliance on clean energy and help to stabilise energy storage and production, being able to respond quickly in less than a second to local surges in electricity demand. The ecological value of the site will also be improved through this development, with improved landscaping and planting of native species, with the development achieving over 10% biodiversity net gain. In the consideration of this application, officers have concluded that the benefits of this development do clearly outweigh the harms associated and these benefits constitute very special circumstances. The proposal is considered to comply with policy R4 of the core strategy and the MPPF and is therefore recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lowes. Uh, Mr. Bulmer, do you want to come and have a seat just opposite me, please? Um, so if you just press the button on the bottom of the microphone and the red light should come on. Yeah, that's Is that great. Okay? Yeah, just make sure you're close to the microphone just so everyone can. Is that better? Yeah, thank, okay, you. thank you. Um, so you'll you'll have three minutes. We'll start the clock when you start speaking. And if you run up to three minutes, I'll just ask you to wrap up what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to wish the committee good evening. Thank you for listening to me. I would like to start my objection with proximity. This battery storage facility is far too close to my residence. It is 30 metres from my front door and 10 metres from my front garden. The highest part of the development, which is a substation, is right next to my garden. The substation is visually oppressive. It looks like an electricity substation. It does not look nice. This will have a massive impact on my family's view and our enjoyment of our garden. 
the noise that this development will make, and it will make it every day for 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, will massively impact my family's life. We won't be able to live with that. My family have decided if this goes through, we have to move. But then we're stuck because no one wants to buy our house. It's too close. I'm not against these type of developments whatsoever. And as the council will be aware, there are two further developments. One has put planning permission in only last week and another from the <coughs> golf club, which will be put in in the next couple of weeks for bigger developments in a better place, more hidden. And I'm in full favor of those two other developments. One is 200 megawatt and the other is 100 megawatt. This is right in the middle. It's next to my house, it's right next to it. It's as the distance of this room. So you will see a substation less than the distance of this room away from my house when I sit in the garden. 10 meters is nothing. And for them reasons, they're the reasons I'm complaining. F Fairy Lane itself is a private road, a private lane. The public have access, but the speed limit is 60 mile an hour. It's also only wide enough for one car and a car has to move to pass. All these heavy goods coming down this end of the lane, where there is far more traffic than Golf Road, is just going to cause utter, de not destruction of the lane, but you won't be able to get in and out when you need to get out. And this is going to go on for two or three years. What else did I have? I would like to conclude there. Thank you. I'm very sorry to uh, finish. Thank you, Mr. Bomer. Yeah, if you want to take your seat at the back again, please. Okay, cheers. Uh, thank you. Uh, and if we could have uh, Jenka Kaslik now, please come and have a seat and just make sure the microphone's on. I think it is, and just bring yourself close to the microphone. That's great. And is, it, is it on? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, you'll have three minutes to speak to us again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman. In order to meet the government's carbon reduction targets under the Climate Change Act, the energy balance is becoming increasingly reliant on renewable energy sources, such as wind and solar, which can be intermittent and unpredictable. This, coupled with the phasing out of fossil fuel power stations, means there's a growing need for new power solutions that can respond quickly to local spikes in demand and ensure a secure supply of energy for the local network. With record levels of renewable energy sources generating our power, battery storage can help us make the most of this green energy, using it to manage peaks and troughs in demand and operate as efficiently as possible. The proposed system would have the capacity to support approximately 300,000 homes for up to two hours at a time during periods of peak demand. Facilities must be located close to an existing grid supply point with both import and export capacity. The South Manchester GSP is the only one of the 17 in ENW's network that has the required capacity available. In order to minimize transmission mission losses and be economically viable, sites typically need to be located within a kilometer of their connection. The only non-developed land within a kilometer of the South Manchester GSP falls within the designated green belt. The site was selected due to its proximity to the substation, a willing landowner, limited ecological value and compatible adjacent land uses, including the existing battery storage facility that is at, um, on Mr. Bolner's land to the east of his property. It is also well screened and existing by existing topography and vegetation and has a low probability of flood risk. Battery technology is a clean energy system and does not create emissions. Detailed assessments have been undertaken to support the application and in all cases have confirmed that the proposals would not result in any unacceptable impacts. The very special circumstances that would outweigh the low level of harm to the green belt by reason of inappropriateness has been demonstrated. This development would help to prevent local power interruptions and would therefore uh, contribute to the local economy by means of electricity security whilst achieving a biodiversity net gain of over 10%. It will also support increased renewable energy generation contributing towards net zero and reduced energy wastage. 
close to the existing substation, capable of being substantially screened by existing and enhanced landscaping, and able to achieve noise levels that don't exceed background at the closest receptors, the proposed development provides a suitable site for this facility, which will provide vital backup energy generation and balancing capability to the local network. Trafford Council has declared a climate emergency and is aiming for carbon neutrality. We hope that members can follow their officer recommendation and support this development, which clearly aligns with those aims. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kaslick. I'd just like to return to your seat. Um, before we get into debate, I wonder if we could just ask for some advice. I'm not sure if it would be from Ms. Lowe's or, or Mr. Everson, just about the the impact of the of the traffic that Mr. Mr. Bulmer mentioned. Obviously, I know there's a proposed condition to manage the construction phase, but um, I wonder if there's any advice on the specific point that Mr. Bulmer raised about the fact that it's a single track road and so the construction traffic is, is likely to block access for residents and other people using that road. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, in terms of when we, we assessed the, the application um, and we didn't believe that there was any reason why we couldn't get construction traffic along Ferry Lane. Um, there is, as you've mentioned, there is a condition re related to the construction uh, management plan. Um, and if there are any difficulties with some of the apparatus, then it's not uncommon in a lot of cases whereby they do some accommodation works um, and we could do control that through the construction management plan and then put the those Oops, un undo those works effectively um, potentially um, that's not not uncommon and it's part of the works if it is deemed that some of the plants may have difficulties getting getting to the site um, it often happens with wind farms and the likes particularly out in this type of uh, environment so we didn't feel that was a problem thank you that is useful thank you um any members of the committee looking to speak on this item please Councillor Welton. Thank you. Um, uh, it's it's really tricky when we have these developments that are close close to residential um, properties. I can very much understand why somebody wouldn't want something like this built very close uh, to their house. Um, obviously, I think, and it is green belt land. Uh, sounds like this has a there is a strong purpose behind this, a special. A very special reason for building on the green belt so uh, you know with this particular case i think it's a good reason for building on the green belt if we're going if we're going to do it um ever you know it's it's, it's being done for all the right reasons um looking at the uh, you know looking at the, the the section on residential amenity it's the the committee report suggests that the, su suggests that the screening um will mitigate the visual aspects plus the sound so which would suggest that there's not you know whilst there is inevitably going to be an impact on the residents residential amenity it, it's not going to be great enough for us to as a committee to justifiably reject this application without you know without the uh, justified fear that we would be overturned if this went to appeal um i can't see any issue that would you know that that, that, that would be strong enough um for 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 that to happen for that um for it not to get turned over later on uh so i think on balance i'm probably i'm uh i will be voting in favor of this development i think and i would be happy to propose it thank you thank you councillor welton councillor thomas thank you chair just a definitely a catch-22 situation with uh the the benefits of the bess uh against green green belt building on uh, i have strong sympathies having looked at the the site layout with mr bulmer um in terms of where the the uh, transformer is sited i do wonder whether or not there is a a potential to to relook at the plan not the the build up and move the transformer to uh, the further corner um which is further away from from his property they pick the corner that it is is closest to the property of Mr. Bulmer. Having said that, 
I'm not an electrical, electrical mechanical engineer or designer, so I'm not sure that is possible. There are reports that I don't think we've seen that need to be put forward in terms of uh, the tram network, TGFM. Uh, don't recall seeing, so I mean, that, that's still in the air. But uh, again, I'm leaning towards uh, accepting the uh, officer's decision, on, but I, I would like, if possible, for the... Uh, the design to, to be looked at and see whether or not that is uh, a small movement that the uh, development can take to perhaps uh, lessen any impact on uh, on residential amenity. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Minnis. Got a huge amount of sympathy for um, residents nearby. Um, to have this this near near them built near them, but I also understand the need for storage of electricity, um, and so that we can keep so we can store it. If we're going to have renewable energy, we need to um, collect it when, like, say, for example, solar panels in the daytime, and then release it for the nighttime usage um, and peak evening, you know, say evening hours, etc. So I think that there's there is need, and it is something that actually I I, I would say that green belt development is actually probably the is probably the correct use for it, um, but yes, huge amount of sympathy for neighbours. I don't know. Um, yes, and similar to Councillor Thomas, if there's any way of mitigating and trying to lessen the harm, then that would be great. Uh, but ultimately, I'll, I'll be voting in, in favour and, and happy to second um, Councillor Welton's proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Millis. Any other members looking to speak? I mean, I think what I would say is, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Councillor Welton and Councillor Millis. I'm, I'm happy to vote in favour of this development. Um, there's obviously a lot of comments from, from neighbouring residents, but these are going to be a feature of the landscape in years to come. We're going to need a lot more of these facilities to um, store electricity as we move towards renewable sources. And, and actually, I think this is not a bad site for, for this sort of facility. I think in terms of the noise, which Mr. Former mentioned, there are, and I think the report sets this out clearly, there are quite high levels of background noise anyway, because it's close to the M60 and the Metrolink. And there's another facility being built to the northeast of Mr. Bulmer's property, um, which I think in the, so in the report, it says that is 90 metres to the northeast, presumably that's from this application site. And I think Mr. Bulmer's house sits between this application site and that facility. So there's already noise from a, a similar facility, albeit a smaller one in, in that area. So um, I do have sympathy for, for the fact that it's being built right near Mr. sort of Bulmer's property but I um actually in terms of the impact on the wider area I think this is this is a good site for this sort of facility so I'll be voting in favour myself. So, Councillor Thomas you wanted to say something else? Yeah sorry just to clarify uh, it's the EMV report uh, on electromagnetic uh, uh, thing with the thing and um, I'm, I'm assuming that, that will be uh, either in place before anything starts and on, on that note I will I'd note it's not been yet I'll second Councillor Welton's proposal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think Councillor Minister seconded it. But um, could we, um, Miss Lowes, do we do we have any more information about the the EV report that the Metrolink and the possible interference? I think the the EMC. Yes. So there's two conditions on um, the the decision that would require them to be submitted. Um, there's one that there's a report that needs to be to submitted prior to operation, and then if there's any variation in the electromagnetic magnetic charges to come in second. So there's a kind of doubling um, security to, on, on that part of it. So yeah, there's two conditions that cover that. Thank you, Ms. Lowes. Uh, any other members looking to speak on this item? Councillor Proctor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's, it's a question. Um, I'm sorry, it's gone totally out of my head. Just give me a minute. Any other members looking to speak whilst uh, we see what Councillor Proctor wants to ask? Uh, Councillor Wynne Stanley. Oh, sorry. Councillor Proctor. I've, I've remembered. I'm sorry. When I've read about the noise levels that um, the battery installation will produce, they're lower than the noise from the M60 and the um, Metrolink. That's correct. 
Yeah. And then my other question was, can we put a condition in so that um, lorries don't go to the site um, around school opening and closing times? Is that possible? It is. I think there is a condition to that effect already. I'll just come to Miss Lowe's just to give some advice on that. On, on your first question, you're, you're correct. The background noise levels um, that exist and um, the noise that would be generated from the, the development would be lower than that. And it's actually not the batteries that create any noise. It's the fans that cool them. Um, and on the second question, there's a construction management plan um, added, a condition added, which specifies that no HGV movements shall take place during um, school pick off pick up and drop off times and specifies and um, set um, hours when they can't take place. Thank you, Ms. Lowe's. Any other members looking to speak? Councillor Hassan. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it is really a very, uh, it's no problem to, uh, to favour this application, uh, but the gentleman was uh, speaking against this application saying it's about how many metres, is it 10, 10 metres away from his property? Right, so all we need to do is make make sure that he, the president's safety, mental and mental health is very important and try to make sure we can do more, the best thing we can do, the robust things in, in regards to mitigate the noise. This is all I want to say. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Hassan. There is, there is some information in the additional info report, I think, about further... Uh, landscaping which i think um will have a an, an additional um benefit on the noise reduction as i understand it um okay any other members looking to speak it has been moved and seconded it we we grant planning permission in accordance with the recommendation so i think we'll move to the vote on that then all those in favor of uh, granting permission as per officer recommendation okay and anyone against Okay, that is unanimous. So permission is granted for that application. And thank you for the speakers who came to speak on this item. So just for members of the committee, we've still got technical difficulties with the um, the screen behind us. So um, what Ms. Curley is just advising me is that they can print copies of the presentation and we could probably do one between two. If, if those members who've got their laptop with them, which I haven't, we can it can also be emailed to you so you can, you can look at it on your own laptop if that's of benefit. So should we do that? Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, who, if you just let me know if you've got a, a laptop or a device to to look at it on, and then Miss Milner can email to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Can I just check if Rachel McDowell is here, please? Yeah, and is uh, Zoe Reynolds here as well, please? Yeah, okay. So we'll move on to that item now. So it's um, application 109856, which is 299 Ashley Road in Hale. Uh, that starts on page 82 of the bundle. Uh, and we'll start with a um, an introduction from Ms Milner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This application site relates to a large, um, recently constructed residential property set back from Ashley Road within spacious ground. The majority of the site is within the green belt with only a small um, northern section of the site um, partially covering the house um, outside the green belt. Part of the site is designated for a wildlife corridor, area for protection of landscape character and to the south, um, 
river valley floodplains with land levels dropping towards the river valley. There is an existing track running from Ashley Road along the northern edge of the site, which provides access to the properties of 295, 297 and 299 Ashley Road, with 299 being the application property. The proposed um, development relates to the southern part of the property Kirtledge and an area of grassland formerly a paddock. The site is currently accessed by a single lane shared track from Ashley Road. The proposal is to construct um, a new private right way and the erection of fencing gates and associated landscaping. During the construction of the property um, that is now on site, a track was installed for construction traffic. This application is for a permanent farm style track on the same route, um, although it would have a, a slightly reduced width, um, I think from 4.9, sorry, from 5.2 to 4.9. It would have a central grass verge planted um, with no curbs or edging. Um, the access would become the main access route for 299 Ashley Road, although the existing shared access would be retained. It's also to pr propose to replace the existing cattle, sorry, cattle grid at the Ashley Road entrance with a continuation of the existing cobbled sets. In addition, it's proposed to erect a small section of um, timber fencing um, on the south of the Ashley Road entrance and also um, Cheshire estate railings adjacent to the uh, timber, rail, um, timber fence and um, around the proposed access track. At the in eastern end of the access track, a new section of the state railing, um, state railing fencing is also proposed. It's considered that the proposed access track would constitute a minor, minor engineering access operation and the fencing would have no harmful impact on the openness of the green belt and would not impact on the, any of the five purposes of the green belt in line with the MPPF. As such, it's acceptable in principle in regards to the green belt. Furthermore, the proposed track retains a rural character in keeping with the context of the site and the open countryside feel of the property. The additional fencing and gates um, in estate railings are considered to be in keeping with the character of the site. And it's also considerable to have a considerable impact on residential amenity um, and not impact um, harmfully impact the outlook or privacy of neighbouring properties. Um, objections um, received are noted um, and just to confirm, as detailed within the air, um, the impact on the existing trees is considered to be minor and has been given limited weight, but there will be no harm to the trees on site. Therefore, um, on balance, it's considered that the proposal is in accordance with national policy in regards to Greenbelt and local policy within the MPPF and householder development. Therefore, subject to conditions, we do recommend approval. Thank you, Ms Milner. Um, Ms McDowell, do you want to come and have a seat just opposite me, please? All right. So I think the microphone is, is still on, so just make sure you're close to the microphone so we can pick up on what you hear. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that's <clears throat> clear. Um, so you'll have three minutes to speak to us, and if you run up to three minutes, I'll just ask you to start to wrap up your remarks, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, good evening. I'm Rachel McDowell of 295 Ashley Road, and I'm objecting to the planning application submitted by Mr. and Mrs. Jones on behalf of 10 households. The site lies within the, in, green, in green belt, where development is only allowed in certain limited scenarios. We consider that the development will harm the appearance and openness of the area and will lead to encroachment of the countryside. There is no justification for the development since there is an existing permanent access owned by 299. As part of the construction of the new house, the council agreed to the creation of a temporary access road for construction traffic. Condition 11 of the planning permission dated November 2019 required that this access be permanently closed and reinstated in the interest of visual immunity and impact on the openness of the green belt. This was reimposed in 2022. Nothing has changed, the condition is still valid. The photos included within our objection letter show the significant visual changes which will result should this development be allowed. The existing road was aligned to maintain the open aspect while the proposed road cuts through the paddock having an urbanizing effect. The photo montage submitted subsequently by the applicant shows a computer generated artist's impression of a view sometime in the future with mature trees. This is not a fair reflection. 
There is a grave concern that if permission is granted, it's highly likely the proposed track will be upgraded over time to become a more formal road. The planning history on site shows how non-material amendments have been used. The planning officer's report states the track will have no impact on the outlook of the closest residential properties. Creating a new road in the open field spoils the visual immunity, as at present traffic is well screened by a large head hedge. The temporary road is often used for parking by visitors to the site. We are concerned about the unaddressed impact the road will have on the capacity and functionality of the floodplain. Additional information provided tonight has confirmed that the existing track will remain in use for 299. The proposal is for the eastern end of the track to be gated, not closed off, giving the applicant a circular in and out route. Our tree advisor considered that there'll be no material benefit to the trees from reducing the traffic from one house on the existing road. Again, additional information provided this evening changes the officer's report to give only limited weight to any benefit on the drive for the trees. It will still be used by 299. Finally, we do not believe a householder application is the appropriate route for this application because the paddock does not form part of the domestic curtilage of the property. Cold Appeal's access statement of 2019 clearly identified that the area was not part of the domestic curtilage. In summary, the proposed development cannot be considered appropriate development due to the impact it would have on the landscape, extending the urban edge of the settlement into a previously undeveloped open area of paddock adjoining the River Bolin. It would be highly visible from Ashley Road and as such would harm the visual amenity of the area. There is no need for the development given the presence of the existing road. Thank you, uh, Ms. McDowell. If you just want to return to your seat, please. And uh, sorry, Reynolds, if you could um, come and take the seat opposite me, please. And again, you'll have uh, three minutes and we'll start a timer once you start to speak. OK, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the Planning Committee. This application proposes to utilise existing construction access, which has been in place for over three and a half years, to become the main access for the occupiers in the form of a private way. The private way has been designed to have a farm track style appearance with a central grass verge and will have no curves and edges. As set out in the officer report, it has been accepted that the proposal constitutes minor engineering works, which is considered appropriate in the green belt. The proposed access adjoins the existing shared access with 295 and 297 Ashley Road. The proposals will have no impact on highway safety and the council's highways team has raised no objection. It's been considered in the officer's report that the proposal has a positive impact on trees, with the council's tree officer supporting the reduction of traffic across the root protection areas of the veteran and mature trees along the shared access. The officer's report also considers the proposal will not harm the character of the curtilage of 299 Ashley Road and would be acceptable in terms of its impact to residential amenity. To facilitate the private way, minor amendments to the existing fencing and gates are proposed, with new fencing and gates to match existing. Cobblestone sets are to be extended at the entrance of the shared access and main entrance gates to 299 Ashley Road. These works will be, ru these works will be rural in character and will be in keeping with the rural setting. Overall, the principal development has been considered acceptable and will not impact the openness of the green belt and rural character of the property's curtilage. The proposal has a positive impact on the existing trees and is acceptable in terms of highways and residential amenity. I hope that you can agree with the officer's recommendation for approval and are mindful to support the application. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. If you want to return to your seat, thank you for speaking to us. Um, Ms Milner, I just wonder if I could ask for some uh, advice on something that uh, Ms McDowell mentioned, which was around um, a fear that the, the track that's proposed might be upgraded in the future to something more substantial. Um, obviously, the current appearance is described as sort of a farm track, which which it does look like. If the, if the applicant did want to upgrade something more substantial, what would happen then? Would that require a new application? Yes, it would. As with the, with the original planning application for the house, we removed permitted development for the entire site. Um, and so in terms of where we are now, if they were to upgrade further, they would require consent. Um, so, yes. Thank you. Uh, any members looking to speak on this item? Councillor Chalkin. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, I do know the site. It's around the corner from my house. 
Um, I, it's a tricky one because I can see where the officers are coming from in in their report, um, but I also sympathise with the residents. Uh, I love those houses. The outlook from those houses is great, and it's it, this road putting a driveway there would spoil it. So I do sympathise with the argument that there is an impact on their immunity there. But my principal problem with this is actually traffic related. Um, I know highways have raised no objection, but that entrance is it's a blind entrance. Um, you don't know whether you're coming out of it or whether you're going into it. You've no idea what's there. Um, you, the way the drive is, is currently configured now, it force, if you're coming out of those properties, you're, you're forced to come at a, a slow speed. Um, the danger of putting in a long straight road, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sound a bit stupid here, but the, the, the danger of putting a uh, but a long straight road in a house of that type, knowing what vehicles go with houses of that type, um, it just means that you're risking a car coming speeding out straight straight onto Ashley Road. In my mind, um, creating a, a very significant traffic risk there, a highways risk. So. I'm not minded to support it on that basis. I know it's fairly, it's, it's maybe fairly weak, but I, I can't, I can't support it on that just because of that. Um, welcome to your other thoughts. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Chalkin. Um, Councillor Service, I wonder if I could just come to you for the point that can, on the point that Councillor Chalkin raised just about what assessment was done of the high risk risk through having that new entrance point or it being made a permanent entrance point as opposed to a temporary one. In terms of the the point raised, um, there are gates to control the the speed potentially in terms of coming straight out. I would imagine it can happen, but equally the people are using it and are aware that the junction is there. First of all, um, in terms of the access, it, it is already there, and whilst it may not meet the full requirements it's it's already it's already an access with an access ultimately if it's not granted this they will have their existing situation so it was de it was judged on on what was before us ultimately um but yeah potentially anyone on a straight section of road should they wish they they could potentially speed um there's not a lot we can unfortunately do about that but the, the site the access is already there so we have to judge what whether or not if it was a brand new access then in terms of visibility and those issues that would be a completely different situation and we would have to judge it on on that merit but it already has a, a, it already is an access and will be an access even if this is not granted in this in this form so that's the why we we judge what we judge it on not necessarily meeting the full criteria i'm afraid Thank you, Mr. Everson. Uh, Councillor Welton. Thanks, Chair. Um, special circumstances for for building on the green belt. I can't see them. I can't see them here. Um, you might maybe you can update me on that um, in, in in a bit. But there's already a road, um, you know, uh, that that goes to the property. So do we need another one? I don't buy the the argument in the officer's report that this is a country lane um, because it's, you know, most country lanes don't run parallel to another road that goes in exactly the same direction. You know, it's not a, a country lane is on its own, surrounded by lots of fields, you know, and it's, that's the one, that's the, the, the one lane that, you you know, you, you get to, loot, to use. This is in, effectively... It, extending the urban sprawl no matter what, what it looks like now you know um you know they might be trying to dress it up as a country lane but it's you know this is this is a, a property that's built being built on the edge of an urban area and creating another access path extends that uh, um, access track extends that urban area you know it's, that's the, the, the the fact of the matter i can't i i can't see this as just a a country lane mm. In the countryside, it, it, it seems, you know, a, a very convenient argument. This is green belt lands. We need special circumstances. I can't see a special circumstance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Welton. I'm just going to ask for some advice on that point because my understanding was that 
um, very special circumstances don't need to be demonstrated here because the proposed development doesn't um, offend one of the purposes of Greenbelt, but I'll ask Miss Milner to advise in a clearer way than I've just done. Thank you. Um, not necessarily offend the purpose of the Greenbelt, but it's more about whether it's um, considered to be an exception and not form inappropriate development within the Greenbelt. So we've assessed it as an engineering operation which wouldn't be inappropriate development within the Greenbelt. And therefore, the very special circumstances that you're referring to, it's a, it's a different exception. So we're not looking at very special circumstances. We're saying it's not an inappropriate in de development in the Greenbelt as an engineering operation. Okay. <laughs> I, I can. So within the MPPF, it sells out um, for assessing proposals within the green belt. It says inappropriate development is by definition um, harmful to the green belt and should only be allowed in very special circumstances. But then it sets out that there are certain types of development that are not classed as inappropriate development. And there's a, there's a big list. Um, so, for example, buildings for agriculture, um, extensions that aren't disproportionate in size, um, even limited infilling in villages. Um, it also goes on to say there are other exemptions, such as um, public um, transport infrastructure, engineering operations, that's two separate points, um, and material changes of land. So. The test of whether very special circumstances is needed is only if it's considered inappropriate development. Once you move it out of the inappropriate development category into what is appropriate development, you do not need very special circumstances. There's already an access track for this property. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're effectively duplicating what's there already. So, I mean, I, I don't understand how that isn't... In a, you know, just because it's an engineering function, what you know, this seems like you know, it seems like a real attempt to 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 find a reason to to justify this. Whereas it, it's you justify the unjustifiable, I suppose. Really, uh, I, I I can't, you know. This well, is the this is. Uh, sorry. Yeah, maybe. This is our assessment. Obviously, as the decision makers, it will be for you to consider whether you consider it to, to fall within um, appropriate or inappropriate development, and therefore whether the tests um, are necessary. But from our assessment, we've concluded it would be an engineering operation. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Councillor Alcanola. Can I just clarify? So, the, the exist, there is a track that's already used but they've made a temporary one and it's the temporary one they want to make into a permanent one and that's what they're getting permission, they're asking permission for. Yeah. So what happens if there isn't permission given? What happens to the temporary one? And is all the land that's being used, is it, does it belong to, I know that's, it doesn't matter in planning terms who the land belongs to, but I'm just interested. If this permission isn't granted, they would still be required to, to remove the um, the track. So the track at the moment is just a construction tra track. If it doesn't get permission to be permanent, they would then be in under, um, the condition would require that it's, it's still removed. And in regards to land ownership, yes, this is um, within the ownership of the applicant. So with it being a track then at the moment, it, I can't remember seeing anything about tarmac. I can't remember what it said about the ground bit. It's mud at the minute, but it's not going to stay mud though, is it? If it's, um, it's, so, so it's paragraph about 10. taking out a grid. Oh. Paragraph 10. So I think it's going to be uh, crushed aggregate. Crushed aggregate, yeah, and with with grass, a grass verge in the middle. Right. So it's not turned, um, Did you have anything else you wanted to say, Councillor? No, Canola? thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll come to Councillor Wynne Stanley now, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I can't, don't think I can vote for this. Um, I don't. I think the. 
the arguments about the legality of the green belt, I think it's very, very finely balanced. I don't think this is required for the access to the to the new house. I think they've already got the access. And the idea of build, building of making permanent a construction track, um, which runs across the green belt, which could impact on the visual amenity of the people who are already there, uh, but also it's the green belt. So I don't think I can be voting for this. So I will be voting against officer recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Winston. Down there. Uh, Councillor Thomas, did you want to speak? Thank you, Chair. It, the terminology we use in Country Lane, it, it's basically a driveway to the to the home. It's, it's nothing more than that. If you go down there today and have a look at as is, you wouldn't see anything particularly out of place. You would think, oh, there's a driveway down to a big house at the back. Um, the mound of earth that has to go and my point of view is that when this was put in, there was probably an idea to put this planning application forward and it would have perhaps served them better to have done that in the first place. But as it is, the, the road is there. The impact through the trees from the 295 and 297 is minimal. It's a residence. It's not going to be a thoroughfare. There's going to be four or five cars going up there, perhaps once or twice a day. So the amenity that's lost is is negligible. It's going to have um, the 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 grassed centre track, if I, if I want to have a better word. Um, so I, I actually support the uh, officer's uh, recommendation to grant, and I'm quite happy to prose as such, purely and simply because it is in situ. If we were going across uh, grass as to each side of this road, then I'd have a different outlet outlook, but it is there and it is in place and it doesn't look out of place from, from my, my thinking. So I support. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Minnis. Thank you, Chair. I think if it wasn't green belt, I'd be more tempted to say it's okay, but I think you've already got access there. I don't think it's necessary and I think it just ends up, you just end up concreting on more green space and it's unnecessary so um it's not concrete it's mud at the moment um so i think that um i can't in, i can't support it i'll be proposing actually that we refuse rec um, um refuse the application and go against office recommendation given that i i, I know that it's appro apparently appropriate to development on the green belt but i did i don't think it's necessary and i think it's I think it personally think it's inappropriate. I get that it's uh, classes as engine. I get what the classification is. I understand what you're saying, but I don't think it's necessary. I think that it, this, it just lands up um, destroying um, what green what green space is there, and it's almost like a eventually it could be a creeping form of development. Thank you. I uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Minister. I so I don't. We always need to be careful at committee meetings not to. Um, speculate or give any weight to the motivations of an applicant so i don't i don't think it's a relevant consideration for us to say that the driveway isn't necessary it's up to the applicant if they want to apply for that form of development they can and it's for us to think about in planning terms whether that's acceptable development or not so i don't think we can question whether it's necessary in the same way that we wouldn't question whether somebody building an extension to get an extra bedroom is necessary we would say you're entitled to make the application um, but but I but I hear what you're saying about the the impact on on the green belt. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Proctor, I'll come to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. They've already done it without planning permission. Well, there's a, a muddy lane that's been dug on the pictures that I'm looking at. Yeah. So I I just. There's already an access route. They don't need another one. And it's, I don't see the, the purpose of it apart from destroying what's a nice field. And yeah, I just don't think it's necessary. I can't, I can't support this. I'll be voting against it. So um, I'll turn to Ms. Curley for some advice now, particularly on the on the green belt designation and, and development that's 
may be permitted there. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, green belts are not an environmental designation. They're a land use designation. They don't have to have any biodiversity interest or any environmental interest. Um, sometimes those two things go together, sometimes they don't. Um, their purpose is set out in the MPPF. Um, they are intended to maintain openness um, and equally um, it's understood and has been understood in uh, planning policy, uh, local and national for since they existed, that some, some things can and should happen in the green belt. Uh, being, green belt is not a bar on development. <laughs> it is a bar on certain types of development. Again, you can, you can justify those through very special circumstances as we found earlier this evening. Um, the, this is an engineering operation. Um, I can understand why members think it might not be necessary, but that's not for questioning. I don't think you can question either whether it's an engineering operation or not. I think that's a matter of fact. Um, and you need to behave reasonably in your decision making, whatever your sort of gut feeling about this is and whatever your gut feeling about green belts are. So it is an appropriate form of development in the green belt. It's also a track, so it's flat. So the impact on openness is always going to be extremely limited. Uh, and there are other things that, that come with it that are set out in the officer report. So your decision making this evening should be about what green belts are in planning terms and what the those exceptions are, not, not on an idea that green, green belts should never be built on, um, because that is not their purpose and that is not why they're why they are designated i hope that's been helpful thank you miss Cowley. um councillor morgan to you next All right uh thank you chair um i'm happy to second uh council minister's uh proposal to oppose this i don't think this is appropriate development in the green belt um and i i mean i live opposite a country track it is muddy so in the winter it gets cars goes to a farm gets cars which get muddy this won't um it is it is a road it's a driveway um and yeah i i, I won't be supporting this this evening thank you thank you councillor morgan um councillor bunting you wanted to speak yes thank you chairman i'm going to agree with councillor thomas i think and the officers um the uh, as has been pointed out the this is not this for reasons which the officers have already explained, this is uh, not an inappropriate development. Uh, the engineering operation is there. It's not for us to go and say, oh, well, that piece of law I don't agree with or that piece of ruling. It, it, for those are the rules that exist and this falls within one of those categories and therefore they're allowed by making their application. Uh, also, there's been a great deal spoken about, oh, is it needed? Or, well, this is not a committee of needs. It's not a committee to justify whether somebody deserves something or they don't deserve something or they should be allowed to have it. They shouldn't be allowed to have it. We simply deal with the applications and do they comply with the regulations that exist. There is also a great deal in the uh, objections about, oh, this could happen or that could happen or this might happen in the future or there's a precedent for this or a precedent for that. And as we all know, there are no precedents in planning. Each application is dealt with its own merits and we can't deal with what might or might not happen at some undefined point in the future. So I can see, and, and there's also to point out the very obvious, and Mrs. Coley has also pointed out a road is flat. Uh, yes, absolutely it is, and therefore the impact upon the green belt and the openness is is very minimal. So there is no real uh, planning reason to refuse this application. Uh, if we do go ahead and refuse it, it's, it's a straight to appeal job. Uh, and uh, I, I will be amazed if the uh, inspector doesn't just overturn the application, uh, over the decision that we made. So on those grounds, Chairman, I can see uh, no reason not to support the uh, proposal already made by Councillor Thomas, uh, and I will be voting in favour of the officer recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. Councillor Hassan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't think there is any green belt issue here because, uh, I mean, only the applicant asking for an XX I don't think it's a public road that we want. I'm very fully agreed, my counsel. Uh, Thomas has said very comprehensively explained things that there is no encroachment issue at all, and there is no horticultural issue at all. And it is, uh, and uh, Ms. Coley has just explained about the, uh, the green belt, and it is nothing to do with the green belt at all. I mean, we have studied it, and, uh, and it is an XX. 
the root is already existing there. It is an access to, uh, to, to the property, the applicant. So I will fully support this application. This is no problem at all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hassan. Um, Councillor Thomas, I'll come back to you, and then Councillor Welton, and then I think we probably need to move to the votes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah, it was just basically to, to uh, I can't think of any planning reason why we can refuse this, uh, as Councillor Bunting said, and I've, in the debate that I've heard, I've not heard one. Considering what's in the report and the additional information that we've been given uh, by Ms. Coley, I've just, I've not heard one reason that we can actually refuse this application other than, in, in, other than the amenity, and the amenity is shielded by trees. It will not impact on anybody's amenity in looking over a green belt field at all. And other than that, I cannot think of any other valid reason to refuse. Councillor Wilson, come back to you. By the token of anything, you know, an engineering construction being permitted to be, be be built and can't be regarded as the green belt, that means that you could just build any track anywhere on the green belt at any time. Is that the case? There'd be absolutely no planning way of stopping that, can I ask? Generally, yes. Tracks are farm tracks and that kind of thing. Granted planning permission for many of them over the years, yes. Because they're because they don't impact on openness. It's not a farm track though, is it? It's not going to the farm. Well, usually on open fields, you it would be it would be a farm track. Usually they're tarmacked, so more uh, sort of harder materials that are, that are proposed you've not been, here. You've not been around the farms of Bowden like I have. <laughs> Okay, I think I think that I mean, for my part, I'm 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 happy with the application. I'll be I'll be voting in in favour of, of granting it when we come to the votes. And and I think that last point is particularly prescient that that you, you know farmers are quite quite routinely will create new access to fields and 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 there'll be a variety. You know, it'll be gravel or it might be tarmacked. I, I you know I agree with Councillor Thomas. I think this is designed in such a way, sort of it looks like a farm track. I appreciate it's serving a property, but. Um, I don't think whether you whether you label this as a driveway or a track really really matters at all. It's to do with the the impact of that on uh, on the green belt. And I and I agree with Councillor Thomas. I don't, I don't think this is an inappropriate form of development for the green belt. It doesn't affect the openness uh, of the green belt, and so I'm I'm quite happy with it. Um, but it's it's been moved and seconded that we refuse planning permission. Um, so we will vote on. Uh, we need to um, reasons. Yeah. So uh, I'm just thinking who proposed against uh, Councillor Minish, you proposed refusing, and Councillor Morgan, you seconded. So um, I don't know if one of you wants to advance some reasons for refusal, please. Um, for me, it was the fact that it's, I think if it wasn't green belt, I would have said yes. Um, the fact that it is green belt, I understand when you're saying that um, the engineering thing, I just don't, I, I'm afraid I can't. I can't agree with the principle of of putting um, tarmac on um, green melt land when it's not necessary at all. Sorry, not tarmac. But the point is, I, I can't see. I can't see the need to put something solid effectively on. on you know, it, 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 you land up going down the road of. I understand farms have. Tra tracks and I'm not disagreeing that you know when you go walking through far around farms but you wouldn't build this through a park you wouldn't have cars going through um a park would you well no where children where there are people no you you do well clearly not parks all the time Tracks go across, not not vehicles um, going on. Well, no, they don't. Not not parks where people are going to in green spaces. Like, anyway. Okay, I disagree. I don't think it's an, it's it's a, um, a necessary thing. You have access already to the property. If you didn't have access, I would say yes, fine. Um, the absence, uh, the, given you have an access to the property already. I don't see why this is needed at all. And I therefore think well, that whilst it's there in, in the, it falls into the, yes, acceptable form of development, I agree, I disagree that it's needed. So, okay. We've already covered well, the Well, it is green belt, so. We've already covered the, we've already covered the facts. We've already covered the fact that um, it's not a, we've already covered, Councillor Minnis, if we could move the debate on, please. We've already covered the fact that it, this is not about necessity. So we wouldn't refuse somebody 
wanted to build uh, an extension with an extra bedroom by saying, well, you don't need four bedrooms, three is fine. So we wouldn't do that. So it's not it's not about necessity. Um, but I'm going to uh, turn to Ms. Milner now for some advice which may help us. I think you, your best course of action is probably to say it would be detrimental to um, visual amenity and character. I think um, from what you're saying, if we put the green belt argument to one side, I think you'd be talking about the visual amenity argument. I'm happy to go with the visual amenity if that's what we have to put down as a reason. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, Councillor Morgan, is there anything you happy with that? Happy to. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Um, we, you've spoken several times already, Councillor Welton, so I'm, I'm uh, okay. Um, is, it, is it possible that this could uh, affect the, I mean, you, you talk about the own openness of the green, the green Belt, but this is creating artificial boundaries, you know, um, borders within the Green Belt, dividing up that field into two, which is, which is affecting the openness of the Green Belt. Surely, can that not be included as a reason? No, I, I think you're still then swaying into the green belt argument. I think that would you're talking about. You can still talk about visual amenity and character, and you could talk about. You could expand on that reason in regards to the, the open character of the site and the subdivision for a, a track. If the Swiss goes to appeal, that would be your. I assume that's what your your. Yeah. So we'd include that within. That'd be covered in the visual amenity and character, okay. and harm to character. Okay, so we've got our suggested reasons for refusal. So let's move to the vote on the refusal motion first. So this is to refuse uh, planning permission against the recommendation from officers. So all those in favour of refusal, if you could raise your hand now, please. Okay, and all those against refusal, please. Five, five. Okay, is that do we need to vote on the agreement? No. Okay, and then we'll vote on the, uh, this is to approve planning permission. So all those in favor of approval, raise now, please. And all those uh, against approval, please. Six. Sorry, so that has been refused. So the refusal motion was, was carried and the approval was not. So permission for that application is refused. Thank you. So thank you for your patience, everyone. The next application we'll look at is uh, number 110093, Longford Park. Starts on page 132 of your bundle and we'll start with the uh, an introduction from Ms Milner. Thank you. Do members have the presentation in front of them? It has been emailed and there are hard copies. Um, There, anybody speaking for or against Longford Park, there is a hard copy available um, on the desk, so you might want to look for it as we speak so you can follow. So this application relates to Longford Park in Stratford. Longford Park is a mid to late 19th century design park landscape and the remaining built legacy of John and Enriqueta Rylands, with much of the park form forming the grounds of the now demolished Longford Hall. The land was purchased by Stratford Urban District Council in 1911 from the Rylands Estate and was opened as a public park in 1912. Whilst Longford Hall was demolished in 1995, a number of important buildings and features remain which connect the park to its history. Longford Park was designated as, as a conservation area in 1996 in recognition of the area's contribution to Stratford's social and cultural history. The proposal seeks a package of improvement works to be carried out across the park, which is subject to a heritage lottery funding bid and a variety of other funding streams. 
The HLF bid, sorry, the Heritage Lottery funding bid seeks to support projects that connect people and communities to, the net, to their national, regional and local heritage. The need for park improvements has been in the planning for a number of years and public consultation has been undertaken from 2020 and with extensive consultation in 2022. Also, the plans have been worked up with ongoing consultation with the Friends of, Loc of Longford Park. Officers acknowledge, given the extent of the work proposed and the stage in the funding round, that further detail is required to secure the package of improvements envisaged in the submission and the conditions listed within the report and the additional information report seek to, to secure that high quality scheme. The proposals relate to all areas of the park, including repairs and alterations to the, the former Longford Hall footprint, Larry Sullivan Gardens, the portico and the ha ha, restoration of the Lombard for community use, and restoration and improvements to park entrances, the formal gardens, the walled gardens, and all of the areas of the park. The main issue is to consider our heritage, residential amenity, impact on the protected open space, highways and parking, ecology, and landscaping. So if you look at your presentation, um, the first um, slide is. is it's just the boundary of the, the park. The master plan kind of covers the, all the areas of the park. And I'll just quickly run through um, what this covers. So in regards to the sports pitches, there's no loss of sports pitches. In fact, the football pitches at the, the, the northeastern side are being reconfigured to, um, to be moved um, up slightly to allow for um, a cricket pitch to be put in place. Um, the cricket pitch will be grass, but there will be a, um, a wicket in the middle, an artificial wicket. Um, there'll also be improvements to the tennis courts and the youth sports area, um, along with basketball courts. So um, that's on the next page with photographs of the existing. Um, then we move up to the western side of the park, and this is where you'll have the pump track. So this is a, a bike path. There's, there's two, two of them proposed, one for smaller children and one for older children. Then we've got improvements to both play areas, the north and south, that are catered for different age children. We've got the reconfiguration um, of Pets Corner and improvements to Pets Corner. Um, we've got improvements to the outdoor space around the cafe, improvements to the disc golf area, so signage, wayfinding, and um, boundary treatment, um, improvements to all entrances. And changes to the car park. There's also upgrades to um, footpaths throughout. Um, and then you've got, you move on to the, the Grand Lawn and the Ha Ha. Um, and then pictures of the portico and the, the footprint as, um, as is at the moment. We've also see improvements to the Long Barn and the outdoor space around the ship on building. Um, there'll be upgrade to lighting in the park. And then, um, the brook um, that currently runs through the park will be decolbited, so it will be opened up um, and it will be visible throughout the park. So that's quite a, an extensive bit of engineering. It is acknowledged that some elements of the proposal, including the installation of additional sports facilities, introduction of lighting columns and alterations to the Long Barn, will result, result in minor harm to the character and appearance of Longford Park Conservation Area. This is considered to be at the lower end of less than substantial in regards to the MPPF and other works, including the reinstatement of, of historical roots and improved heritage interpretation of the original hall, represent substantial heritage benefits when undertaking the balancing exercise required within the MPPF. And this is considered to outweigh the less than substantial harm. In addition to significant public benefits, this is therefore considered to be acceptable in heritage terms. The proposal seeks to retain all existing sporting and recreational facilities with the addition of a new cricket pitch and pump track. Whilst the creation of the pump track in particular was a loss in some areas of open, open and informal recreational space within the park, it is considered that this would not significantly, significantly affect the character of the park and would have wider community benefits. It's acknowledged that some works, including the creation of a new cricket pitch and improvements to the tennis course and the pump track would likely increase visitors to the park and usage of the park, bringing formal uses to currently informal open areas. Nevertheless, 
The use is wholly appropriate to the character of the site as a public park and giving the existing relationship with neighboring residential properties and separation distances, the impact is not considered significant. Additional lighting would increase safety to, to routes through the park and would be controlled by planning condition to ensure there's no undue glare to residents through light spillage or glare. There would be a reduction in car parking throughout the site as we seek to encourage active travel, but there will be an increase in disabled parking spaces. This is um, part of planned improvements to pedestrian routes throughout the park and also improving wayfinding throughout the park and also creation of a new formal access from Rybank Road. There will be improvements to existing facilities with new toilets, including accessible toilets within the long barn, as well as refurbishment of the existing toilet block in the walled garden. However, further detail is required as set, as set out in condition 30. In addition, the site already has toilet provision, including a changing places toilet within the cafe, which is also accessible from outside the cafe. And there are also improvements to site accessibility with resurfacing work to improve the quality of footpaths throughout the park. Deculverting of Longford Brook and habitat creation and improvement work seek to enhance biodiversity and wildlife across the site. And as set out in the air, the Environment Agency have now withdrawn their objection to the scheme. It is acknowledged that the pump track is, is an area of concern for residents and detailed conditions seek to address these concerns with full details necessary to be provided prior to any works commencing on the pump track. However, given the distance between the pump track and residents, the location is considered acceptable in principle. This application presents an opportunity for the council to achieve funding for much needed improvement rights to the park. The proposals are being considered against the MPPF and the council's core strategy, and it's considered the benefits of granting planning permission outweigh any harms in doing so, and therefore approval is recommended. I'd also just like to inform um, councillors that a number of the works proposed, in fact, a substantial amount of the work proposed would be covered by the council's permitted development. However, because of the variety of work proposed and uncertainty over some of the details and in regards to transparency, a planning application has been submitted in full. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Milner. Um, Ms. Murta. Yeah. So if you just make sure the microphone is on in front of you. Thank you. Uh, and you'll have three minutes to speak to us, so we'll start the timer once you start speaking. Okay, thank you. I'd just say, given the amount of detail, that three minutes is certainly not enough. Um, points to cover. Um, Longford Park is a conservation area, is protected open space and a wildlife corridor. There must be preservation of the natural environment and wildlife. Any development must be replaced or replaced with like-for-like -like, um, natural habitat. This includes any proposed parking area extensions. The pump track, the position of this track means that residents in close proximity will have a significant increase in noise, nuisance, potential lack of privacy, given the height of the structure and loss of visual amenity, plus harm to the character of the park. Residents backing onto the park already have to deal with antisocial behaviour at night and around the adventure playground. Construction materials in the conservation area must be like for like. If the pump track meets conservation standards, the positioning is very poorly thought out. This encourages traffic in Cromwell Road entrance and additional traffic through the narrow space access, passive playground and cafe. This is already a dangerous and highly pedestrianised area. Uh, so encourages more cars into uh, an area which is very irresponsible. It's also very important. We have very limited access for ambulance services. It's highly restricted. There is a risk of bikers riding through the brook and over to the adventure player areas where smaller children are in danger of being knocked over. There's also a serious issue with dangerous dirt bikers on this side of the park, um, and this encourages more of antisocial behaviour. There is better access on the eastern side of the park uh, for the pump track, and it is more direct from Longford Road near the stadium and more parking facilities on that side of the park. It is um, more dedicated to sports facilities and there are more importantly no local residents backing on to that area of the park. The Open Brook, this is a concern to local residents who will now need to declare their properties uh, are at flooding risk to an open waterway to insurance companies. The residents need assurance that the volume of water can be controlled using these methods given the capacity to drain into the culvert has been exceeded in recent years and it seems that the surveyors have underestimated the flood risks in the reports. The budget for maintenance on this waterway is vital. 
as it may require frequent desilting and removal of litter blockages. Open water means there is a potential risk of drowning, particularly in such close proximity to children's play areas, and there needs to be safety measures in place. The aim to improve biodiversity may negatively be affected by the presence of a pump trap right next to it. The Japanese gardens, the plans for this area are a travesty. To remove all vegetation from this area and fill it with gravel is completely incompatible with the conservation of wildlife habitat and natural spaces. This is modern design interpretation in an affront to the park aesthetics. There are several other issues within the design appearance of the park outlined in some of the planning objections that should be accounted for, including the demarcation of green spaces. Overall, there is a lack of amenities in the design, including toilets, bins, seating and cafes area. There would have to be assurance of significant budget increase of maintenance to additional facilities. Currently, there's no budget to maintain the facilities within the park presently. Easy to spend a bulk amount, but budgeting for proper maintenance takes real management, and this is seriously lacking at the moment. Long-term okay, maintenance Merton, is going remarks. to be Thank required you. and defined budget. Where is the money coming from and how long will it last to maintain the park? It's not a one-off. Okay, thank you. If you'd like thank to you. return to your seat at the back, please. Is um, Graham Atherson with us? If you'd like to come up to the seat opposite me. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Atherson. You'll have uh, three minutes to speak to us once you start talking. Thank you. Okay, evening. Thanks, Chair and Committee. So just want to use this time to outline the, the benefits of the application. Um, clearly, Longford Park's a well-loved, well-used park uh, with really strong community and volunteer involvement. Uh, friends Group, Pets Corner, the Community Allotment Group, Disc Golf, the Scouts, all operating there within the park. He's also got the cafe and popular events such as the, the park run. We've listened carefully to all those all those groups as well as individuals in the public consultation. That's uh, for, helped formulate the, the plans in front of you. Um, in terms of the benefits, um, we're looking to address the defects within the park with restoration of historic features, so the war garden, ha-ha, the remaining elements of the, the hall, the portico. Drainage is a big issue, as, uh, as a lot of people uh, know within the park. Waterlogging and... Uh, flooded footpaths are, are commonplace, so key to this is opening up Longford Brook, and we're linking this to the wider wider landscape. We have done a full hydrology assessment within the plans, um, so we're very confident in terms of the, how that works. Um, Long Barn, we're restoring the building, uh, bringing it into positive public use uh, as a hub for the community and volunteering groups. In terms of sport and play, we have improvements to both play areas, new equipment and, and surfacing creating a BMX pump track, as we've heard. Uh, they've got majority support for that in the, in the public consultation, it should be said. Uh, we're making space for cricket pitch with an artificial wicket, resurfacing the fence and fencing the, the tennis courts uh, and the multi-use games area. There's improvements to disc golf as well. Reconfiguring Pets Corner, so there's improved facilities for animals and the volunteers. We're addressing the traffic issues, so in the design and access statement, it clearly sets out a number of actions to reduce the number of vehicles moving through the park, where they remain, how they will be segregated from pedestrian use where possible. Accessibility is a key driver. Um, we're new footpaths from Edge Lane, Cromwell Avenue and Rybank Road, the resurfacing of others. Um, we hope to provide users with a greater understanding of the heritage of the park through the interpretation proposals. That includes a permanent exhibition within Long Barn, and also the internal footprint of the, the hall will be modified to set out the rooms as it was, uh, as it was intended and used. Uh, we're improving the lighting, which is uh, for the use, safety of users. We're creating more welcoming entrances to the parks, befitting of a conservation area, um, and we're making improvements to biodiversity, new tree planting, areas of meadow, and wetland areas. So in summary, um, the implementation of these proposals, I would suggest, leaves the park in a better condition more accessible, with a greater range of facilities to meet the wide, uh, wide range of needs of the community. Um, finally, planning permission uh, unlocks the next phase of the, uh, the funding application. So we're, we're looking for a £3.2 million grant from the National Lottery. That also includes a management and maintenance plan funding as well to address some uh, concerns raised earlier. Thank you, Mr. Allison. If you'd um, like to return to your seat. And uh, Councillor Jarman, you're here to speak for the proposal so um you'll have up to five minutes um we'll start the timer when you start to speak thank you okay thank you chair i don't intend to use uh four or five minutes um 
Yeah, I'd just like to welcome the application. Um, the Heritage Lottery Fund bid has been a, been a long process, which is a result of a lot of hard work by officers, staff, volunteers and friends of Longford Park. This is a one-off opportunity for funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund for what is widely regarded as one of the best parks in Trafford. Longford Park is, a, is in a sorry, conservation area and the recent public consultation identified improvements which they, they wanted to see. Uh, for example, in, in new facilities, the, the BMX pump track, uh, sports facilities such as a, a cricket pitch, as well as uh, new infrastructure, including paths and gateways. Um, refurbishment of existing facilities, such as the Long Barn for volunteering activities, the car parks, Pets Corner, tennis courts, uh, the Longford Hall footprint and, and portico, um, which is all uh, going to be enhanced to emphasise the heritage of the hall and the gardens. Environmental improvements, um, including the opening of Longford Brook and the works to address the flooding, serious flooding issues we've seen uh, in the past, past the promotion of active travel and the reduction of car use. Um, the recommendation is to grant, so what I hope uh, you're, you're going to approve is, is improvements to almost every aspect of the park. Whilst I accept there is opposition to certain uh, to certain aspects of it, and, and some of it uh, well grounded, I will. It will be a fantastic overall benefit for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jarman. Um, members of the committee, look at speak. I'll come to Councillor Proctor first. Thank you. This is amazing. It's such a brilliant opportunity for Longford Park. Um, I propose we. Um, accept this. Thank you, Councillor Proctor. Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chair. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, parks in the area have for a long time now not had the allocation of cash for one reason or another to keep them um, viable. Uh, parks need to, parks certainly like Longford Park, uh, need to attract ages from toddler to OAP that have interests within the park. The uh, pump track I used to do many years ago before I became unfit, uh, I used to do cycle speedway. And in, until I had to go to Tilsley for it because that's the only place you could do it. And young and old alike use that facility fantastically. This is the next stage forward of making sure that Longford Park stays as a park within the community, servicing all aspects of the community. It is a park already. There are parking issues there, we know, but they are there as we speak and isn't really a planning consideration on this particular um, proposal. The only thing, the only downside, and I've only found that out tonight, is that the cricket pitch is an artificial wicket. Uh, we have lost too many grass wickets that are open to public. But it's, a, it's something that's not there before, so there's a cricket pitch there. I wholeheartedly support it, and I'm happy to second Councillor Proctor's uh, proposal to agree. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Minnis. Um, I'm just, just glad to see we've, got, we've, we've ended up managed to get um, some lottery fund to money to regenerate um, a park. I think this is wonderful. I think you've got suitable things there for all ages. Um, and that's great because actually it gives, when when we have mention of antisocial behaviour, actually it gives people things to do. That's what you want. You want um, children of all ages to have things to do rather than, you know, being bored and having nothing to do. They don't want to be cooped up in their houses. They want to be able to go out with their friends and do something fun. Um, so absolutely yes in, in favour. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wynne Stanley. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just, uh, something of an echo chamber in here tonight, I think. Um, I'm really thrilled with the plans, uh, particularly around the landscaping, improving the heritage areas around the range of the hall, the uncovered, the uncovering of the brook, which will solve um, 
the flooding issues and also provide a feature in the park. Uh, there's just too many things I can praise in this. I understand the concerns of the neighbours, I do. Uh, as as Councillor Thomas has already pointed out, there are already issues of antisocial behaviour there. There's already issues around parking. I think those things tend to go with parks, wherever those parks are. Some of the issues have been addressed with the um, uh, with the the, uh, the traffic reduction plans as part of this overall. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to support this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Akinola. Um, just a quick question. Um, my assumption is that um, Friends of Longford Park um, are fully supporting this bid. Yes, they do support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hassan. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I've been living this ward and this uh, only two minutes for I've been twenty years, and uh, I've been a, a pleader and advocate for the north of Barrow. It has been ignored, and I'm, I, I will say that uh, we are very lucky enough. Uh, it's, it's not all about the park. It is going to become a holistic park, which will cover the mental and social and sports and cultural uh, values of the North and generations to come. And I've been involved in these groups, community mm -hmm. groups, and uh, it was desperately needed, uh, such an innovation in, in the North of the borough. And, 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 and this will cover uh, everything, the sports and, and in the, the cricket pitch and uh, uh, sun, or, and also there is a bowling green or football pitches and tennis and basketballs and a cafe and and uh, the honorable lady has mentioned about the social uh, anti-social behavior anti-social behavior is in the right in the front of the Downing Street as well so it is everywhere so and and uh, I think uh, it will cover uh, the speaker has just mentioned who has spoken in the favor of this uh, about the ecology assessment has already been done and and then is water logging so it is uh, one of the most beautiful addition will be in the north of the borough and i will fully support this application and, and recommend the application of the of, uh, recommendation of the officers thank you thank you councillor san any of the members looking to speak for my part, I, I'm enthusiastic about the application. I think it's a really good opportunity to to, um, you know, to renovate a lot of features in, in Longford Park, which is a brilliant park, but it is looking a bit tired in places. And um, actually, I agree with Councillor Minnis that you know the park near near to me is 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 doesn't have anywhere near the sort of facilities that Longford Park do. But you regularly get you know teenagers getting on the roof of the bowling pavilion and stuff and. You know, I've told them to get down and I've asked them why they do it and it's because they're bored. Um, but this park has got, it already has a very diverse range of facilities and, and that will improve uh, more so with this work. Um, I understand the concerns of residents, but I do think it's a difficult application because a lot of the detail is vague because I know this has been put together really quickly. And, you know, I'd like to commend the people involved in 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 the bid for the funding and also planning officers for helping to put together this this application so quickly um some of the plans are vague but i think that you know the risk around those is mitigated by the very long set of conditions that we've got uh including regarding the pump track which i know is a concern but i, I can't imagine that a pump track design will be approved that you know consists of lots of concrete banking or whatever it's going to be a, a naturally landscape pump track that that is likely to be acceptable there um Councillor Thomas, do you want to come back in? Yes, yeah, specifically on the pump track, uh, Chair. Um, one of the, in the AIR, the one of the objections were that the demographic will be boys aged 18, 8 to 18 uh, to the pump track. Wholly disagree with that. And only in 2021 in Tokyo, Beth Shriva won our first ever gold medal for BMX. She's a female. Okay? It will attract people that want to use the sport. And if the facilities are good enough, those will have ownership of that facility and ensure that it's kept in the right order and in the right sort of manner. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. It's, uh, yeah, it's a point well made, I agree. Um, so I think we, it's, it's been moved and seconded that we, um, we grant planning permission as per the recommendation. So we'll vote on that motion now, please. All those in...
Uh, no, we can't engage in debate with with um, with with people watching. So we're going to move to the vote now. So um, all of those in favour of granting planning permission, if you indicate no, please. So that uh, is unanimous. So that application is approved. Thank you. I'm going to recommend we take a five minute comfort break. But if we say five minutes, please, just so we can plow on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll resume now with um, uh, application 108808, which is 157 Hale Road in Hale. So thank you for your patience, everybody. This is at page 20 of the bundle for members. Um, we will start with an introduction from Ms. Coley. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the application site is on the corner of Hale Road and Grey Sands Road within a residential area of Hale. The plot currently comprises a large detached bungalow built around the 1930s with a separate detached garage to the east of the dwelling, 
access from Hale Road. The proposal is for the demolition of the bungalow and outbuildings and replacement with two four-bedroom semi-detached dwellings and associated landscaping. The dwellings would be three-storey, which includes accommodation within the roof space. In addition, there would be accommodation at basement level. The frontage of the dwellings would be set slightly further forward of the properties to the west and slightly further back from the dwellings to the east on the opposite side of Graysands Road, in line with the staggered building line along Hale Road. The existing access points to the site would be retained with slight alterations. The dwelling on the west side, plot one, would use the access from Hale Road and the dwelling on the east side, plot two, would use the existing access point from Graysands Road. Both properties will have a private amenity space the west side property would have the majority of its garden space to the rear, and the property on the east side would have private amenity space to the side in front. The proposed development would provide one net additional dwelling following the demolition of the existing property. All detailed matters have been assessed, including the principle of the proposed development, its appearance, scale, layout, access and parking, and impacts on neighbour amenity. All relevant planning issues have been considered, and representations and consultation responses taken into account. The issues are found to be acceptable with, where appropriate, specific mitigation secured by planning condition. In terms of net MPPF paragraph 11D2, the tilted balance, there are no adverse impacts that would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of granting planning permission. It is therefore concluded the application should be approved subject to appropriate conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Is um, Abigail Wilson with us? Come and have a seat opposite. Uh, me, Miss Wilson. So you'll have three minutes to speak to us. Just make sure the microphone's on. If you just press the button on the base, that's it. Is that? Oh, yeah, okay. now we can hear you now. So you'll have three minutes from when you start talking. Thank okay. you. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. As a resident of One Grey Sands Road, I oppose the scale of this development and would like to highlight my concerns and the objections from 13 other local residents. The application site, as we've heard, is a sloping corner plot and this exaggerates the impact of height and density of buildings, massing, separation distances, and resulting loss of amenity. Trafford's policy says infill development shouldn't be at the expense of the amenity of surrounding properties. And here, even the planners seem to treat the proposal as at the very limit of what may be acceptable. They stipulate as many as 18 conditions, including a key one prohibiting any further development without permission. The application describes two-storey housing, but page two of the planning report clearly states the dwellings would be three-storey. With accommodation proposed over four levels, including within the roof, we strongly agree the proposed houses should be treated as three storeys. The steep roof and flat fronted roof gables strengthen this impression, together with windows in roof gables at the front. The planners rely on policy PG1 to identify relevant separation distances. For three-storey houses like these, on a level site, it recommends at least 13 and a half metres separation to the boundary at ground floor level. These houses would only be 10 and a half metres from our boundary and only 12.6 metres at first floor, so we suggest the policy is not met. Also, the site slopes, dropping over half a metre from the proposed ground floor level down to our boundary, so again, we suggest greater separation is required. Even if the houses are treated as two-storey, and as such, it's said the minimum separation distances of 10 and a half metres is met, we respectfully disagree. We say the separation needs to be greater because of the slope. Positioned so close, the houses would be totally dominating, overbearing and oppressive, especially when we're in the garden, with a dense wall of development along most of our side boundary, causing considerable loss of amenity. There'd be clear views from the bedroom windows leaving no part of our garden private anymore, and our landing window would look straight into new bedroom windows. The new roof ridge heights would be two and a half metres higher than our house, and if you add another half metre to this to reflect the slope, the houses will appear immense from our garden. We believe replacing the existing bungalow with three-storey houses would cause loss of sunlight in our gardens and increase shady areas already resulting from the development taken place previously at 155 Hale Road. The proposal would increase traffic and parking on the road at an already difficult junction. In summary, the net benefit of increasing Trafford's housing stock by just one four-bedroom semi is far outweighed, we suggest, by the adverse impact on the local environment and residents' loss of amenity, and we respectfully suggest this application is therefore not appropriate for approval. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, Councillor Young, uh, thank you for your patience. You'll have up to five minutes to speak to us. So we'll start the clock once you start speaking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I do it from here? Well, thank you for letting me speak. This planning application seeks to replace one single-story bungalow with two large and luxurious four-bedroomed houses, each containing four ba bathrooms, two studies, two media and games room, then laundry utility and two cloakrooms, in addition to all the other standard rooms, kitchen, diner, etc., that one would expect to find in an average four-bedroomed house. <laughs> Replacing the Hale Road bungalow with these two three-storey properties will be too dense, oppressive and overbearing. Neighbouring properties on Hale Road have larger plots and frontages. Young families who live in 4A and 6A Graysands Road will lose the sunlight and enjoyment of their front gardens, this being their only garden space with any sunlight. As a corner plot, the impact on Graysands Road of all features must not be treated as of secondary importance to that on Hale Road. But the proposed properties are really only considered in relation to the housing, to the houses to the west on Hale Road. The character and appearance of the houses is very different on Graysands Road. The planning report says that the height, scale, and design of the proposal is very similar to 155 Hale Road, so fits the street scene. But on site, the planners accepted that 155 Hale Road does not represent a shining example of good planning. At the committee hearing for 155 Hale, Hale Road, Members had expressed surprise that the original permission had ever been granted. The difference in ridge levels between the proposed properties and Graysands Road is significant. The new properties would have a steeper roof than the existing bungalow, would be of considerable scale and massing, with a ridge level 2.5 meters higher than the bungalow. The planning report says the new ridge height will be one meter lower than 155 Hale Road, but it will be 2.5 meters higher than one Graysands Road. This will not enhance or sit well in the street scene of Graysands Road. The sloping sites and the change in levels between the houses and the garden of one Graysands Road, which is over half a metre, will increase the perception of excessive height, especially from the rear garden. The adverse impact on the street scene and the Wilson's amenity is not adequately addressed by the six metres set back from the bungalow position referred to in the planning report. The proposed mass of the new buildings adjacent to 155 Hale Road will stick out and dominate the street scene to an unacceptable degree and will overlook neighbours, causing loss of light and privacy. There will be no area in the garden of number one Graysands Road which will not be overlooked by 155 Hale Road or by the the proposed new development. The sloping site and the change in levels between the houses and the garden of one grey sands, which exceeds half a metre, will increase the perception of, excess, of excessive height. The adverse impact of the proposed three-storey development cannot be mitigated by landscaping. The proposal would simply compound the adverse impact already arising from the 155 Hale Road development. The properties would be overly dominating in the street scene and cannot be screened by landscaping. There will also be a significant loss of green space and Hale needs to preserve every single remaining spot of green that it still has. 
I appreciate that this development would add another house to the number of houses that we are expected to provide in Trafford. But I do question whether it is necessary to allow a development on quite this scale. As I said earlier, these are not just houses, but top-class luxury dwellings. And it should be more than possible to build two acceptable four-bedroom semis on a smaller scale. That would not be so overbearingly dominant in the street scene and to the neighbours. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. Is uh, Jonathan Riddle here, please? If you'd like to come and have a seat opposite me. Um, I think that microphone is already on, so just make sure you're close to the microphone. Hello. Uh, is it on? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and you'll have um, three minutes to speak to us when you once you start talking, we'll start the clock. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it's been a while since I was here, actually. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm Jonathan Riddle from Art Design Services, Director of Art Design Services. Um, the client would like to have been here this evening, but he couldn't make it because he's looking after his um, wife who's got dementia, unfortunately. Um the client has lived in the property since 1987. Uh, it was a family home for when he grew up, when his children grew up, and they've obviously, obviously subsequently left home and moved abroad. The proposals are for a uh, two separate semi-detached dwellings for him and his wife and his son, who's coming back from abroad to live in this property to help look after his wife. The design has been well thought out and fully considered in relation to size, height, design integrity, uh, neighbourhood impact, street scene, and also the new emerging Trafford design codes. We've taken on board comments that were made before Christmas, worked very closely with the planning team, team leaders, uh, met them on site to discuss amendments to the proposals, and We've, we've, we've made significant changes to the, the size of the dwellings, the height of the dwellings, the positioning and footprint um, and improved elements on the landscaping as well. We've also produced several visuals, which I think you've probably seen, hopefully, to assist to sort of help um, visualise the street scene elevations, which is something that we talked about um, after Christmas to try and um, help you sort of judge the properties um, and as far as we're aware since we made all the amendments to the scheme I don't believe there's been any further objections other than what we've heard tonight so I just wanted to say that um, the last point is that it is for a family and we've worked with the council on many many schemes for the last 20 years um, providing similar sorts of schemes to, to provide family dwellings. And we urge the committee members to support the planning recommendation for approval and approve the screen to enable the family and members to see out their days in Hale, basically. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to speak to us, Mr. Riddle. Um, I'll uh, just looking at indications of people who want to speak. I'm just going to ask Ms. Cole for some advice on something that um ms wilson mentioned when she spoke to us which was about the separation distances and uh i think her point was that in reality these are three-story houses so the separation distances um should be greater so i want to give some advice on that thank you yes uh, no problem J chairman i can i can explain uh, the separation distances that are mentioned in the report um are those for two-story dwellings but that's because they are privacy distances rather than distances to avoid any kind of overbearing impact um, that so and because there are only windows in the rear elevation that faces onto number one grey sands road at ground and first floor in privacy terms it is a two-story dwelling there are only roof lights in the roof so they would they look up rather than across um, therefore the the distances that are set out in the officer report are the correct ones um, in these circumstances and uh, they either meet or exceed the distances that are, are required thank you Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Minnis, you wanted to speak. Thank you. I was just indulging myself with a Google um, Earth and Google Maps. Now, the thing is, it shows Google Maps is still, it was the old building next door at 155. 
um, and uh, Coopworth has obviously been updated with a new building. I think that's that's I know that's not that is not the application here, but I think that to match something like that would actually be a poor uh, a, a poor idea uh, for this plot. Um, and I mean I don't know how the hell the thing next door got um, got allowed, but that's a different matter. Um, I think that quite frankly the size massing loss of immunity to number one, I think it's unacceptable. Um, and I'll be proposing that we refuse um, this application based on size, scale, massing, height. It is going to be overbearing, loss of immunity to the neighbour at number one. I think it's unacceptable. Um, and that's my that's my proposal. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I broadly like it. The the move forward of the of the property does give the distance. One five five generally is the is the property that would overlook the rear garden of number one. Uh, although I am sympathetic with the uh, resident of number one, I don't think it's enough to uh, possibly um, grant refusal. There's no grounds for it. There's two properties coming out of it. The parking is exemplary. Uh, there's enough room for three cars to each property without any disturbance to uh, the roadways in, in, in sign. And I'm happy to propose that we uh, uh, agree with the officer's recommendation. I do have one query in the conditions. It says that uh, the del avoid deliveries Monday to Friday between 10 and 4, which seem to avoid school hours. That seems to be perhaps only within 10 to 4 rather than outside of them. I think that's a drafting error. Thank you Thank for you pointing right, it I out. I just wanted to double check because I'd suggest perhaps 10 to 3 is, is a better time, but I'm happy to propose that we accept. That's well spotted, Councillor Thomas. We know you're doing preparation. Um, Councillor Chalkin, I'll come to you now. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, so I remember this when uh, it came, uh, when, it, when the planning list came out before Christmas, and I remember looking at it thinking, this is pretty big and monolith well not monolithic but it is um it's a pretty big development and probably unsuitable um uh i do quite like the design um of it it's, there's a lot of thought gone into it and I, and I will um acknowledge the work that officers and the applicant have done to to mitigate a lot of the problems um but i still i'm still of the opinion it's it's too big and it's it's gonna it's overbearing it's going to Overshadow number one, uh, Graysons. Um, if you stand at the bottom of of uh, Graysons Road, looking up, it won't look. It, it will spoil the scene from that direction, uh, in my opinion. I think there's probably a bit more work to be done, um, but I'm happy to second. Well, I'd like to second the council of ministers' proposal uh, to refuse it based on massing and scale. Thank you, uh, Councillor Morgan. Thanks, Chair. Um, to be honest, I haven't decided yet how I'm going to vote on this. Um, I'm interested to just hear more people. Um, I can totally get why they're doing what they, they want, they're, they're proposing. It's a fact it's a replica, give or take, of next door. Um, it, it does actually fit the scene in, in the north side of Hale Road. At that part of Hale Road, it tends to be um, on the south side, it tends to be a bit lower. Um, um, and so this bungalow kind of has stood out up to that point. Um, but it is a big, massive building in comparison to certainly to the to the north of it, um, and there is the the difference in 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 height because of the drop in the hill from Hale Road. Um, um, there's a thing when you represent Hale or Hale Barnes, there is actually hills in Trafford, um, and um, I mean, and it is directly to the south of its neighbours, so it will really impact in terms of the light um, when it, the sun is in um, is outside of the, the peak of the summer. So I'm just not really sure. Um, I think, I think, I think there is an element of, of massing. Um, I'm just not sure if it's enough to reject it. Um, so sorry, I'm just kind of download my thoughts, but um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Councillor Proctor. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to second Councillor Thomas's motion to accept this. I had two concerns, um, one of which I'm, I'm not concerned about anymore. When I looked at it, I didn't realise there weren't any windows facing number one. So 
they're not going to be overlooked. They'll have a, a yeah, not on the top, yeah, on the ground floor and first floor. So they're not going to be overlooked massively by this house. My other concern, which can be addressed by um, conditions, it doesn't comply with Part M on accessibility. That's the only thing it doesn't comply with. It's got ground floor shower rooms. Um, if there could be a condition attached to that, to say they have to have step-free access, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I think there is Councillor Proctor, just bear with me, I'm trying to find which one it is. Point 62. On page 18. Of the officer's report. Yeah. Condition, condition three, Councillor Proctor. It says there should be a condition. Um, it's not in the air, is it? No, I'm sure I remember reading it. Yeah, but we're yeah. trying to find the condition. Oh, oh, it, it is condition three. Yeah. It says, and no access to prevention. Yeah, it's in condition three, Councillor Proctor. Uh, thank you. Um, did you have any more comments, Councillor Proctor? You, you, you done? Yeah? No, that's okay. it. Okay, uh, Councillor Akinola. Uh, I've got nothing further to say now. Shirley just covered the points I was going to second but it's okay. And I was also really pleased that um, this build actually has got, it's future-proofed, and I really like that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wynne Stanley, you want to speak? Yeah, I'll also be brief. I'll be voting in favour of this uh, to return to Councillor Morgan's point about being unsure about the massing. I don't think it is over massing or over bearing. Um, and also we need to give some credit to the developer for working with our uh, with our planning team to, get a, to change the plans in line with uh, those that we requested. So I will be voting in favour of this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ken. Councillor Welton. Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, I've been going through a similar uh, um, uh, process to uh, Councillor Morgan. On this, I do understand that it's um, it's uh, on the you know, on the slope. That does make a does make a difference. It is tall, um, but it is moving back on the plot. Um, and I so what, what I have in my head is the. Uh, uh, is the tilted balance, but and I, uh, and I know we have to take that into consideration. Um, I, don't, I don't think the um, the impact on residential amenity is sufficient to overcome that tilted balance. So I will be voting in favour of the um, proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Welton. I, I was um, going to say something very similar, so I won't I won't repeat it. I, you know, I recognise for the neighbour it's it's different to what's there, so the massing will be different. Um, It'll be set further back, but it will be taller. Um, and for my own part, I'm not sure that um, that is sufficient to to refuse planning permission. Um, so it has been it's been moved and seconded that we refuse uh, permission. And the reasons I heard from uh, Councillor Chalkin were around um, overbearing nature and, and massing. Is that sufficient? Sorry, Councillor Min. Scale and massing. Yeah. Um. Is it in terms of street seeing? Sorry, my usual reminder that scale and massing isn't itself a harm, and you have to identify the harm. But I've heard from Council Chalking that that was to the street seeing. Street yes. seeing on on. on um. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that uh, that's that is sufficient. So we'll vote first on the. Um, on the motion to uh, refuse. So all those in favour of refusal, if you could indicate now, please. Are you voting? Refu in favour of refusal, please. Okay. And against refusal, please. Okay. okay, so that, that motion is uh, is not carried. So we'll, we'll vote now on the motion that's been moved and seconded to grant planning permission. So all those in favour of 
granting permission, please. Okay, and all those against grant of permission, please. Okay, so that application uh, is granted. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for two our speakers. Uh, move on. We'll move on now to um, uh, application 110119, which is 26 Ermston Lane in Stratford. Starts on page 189 of the bundle. Councillor Wynne Stanley's leaving us for this item as, as indicated at the start. And we'll start with um, an introduction from Ms Milner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this application site relates to a two-storey property um, at basement and ground floor is currently a dentist and they're in the first floor and second floor are two two bed flats. The proposal is to extend the dental practice into the first and second floor, removing the existing residential use and creating a um, additional two consultancy rooms, providing a total of four. External alterations are limited to a new platform lift to the front of the property, given the changing levels and alterations to um, the bin storage. Whilst inside the property there's no lift access, it is considered that the improvement to the access into the building is on balance acceptable. The site has um, no off-street parking um, and does provide, um, so there's no off-street parking existing or proposed with the, with the site. However, officers have looked at the site and whilst we do accept that parking demand in the area is high, it is considered to be in a highly sustainable location. It is very close to Stratford Town Centre and is in close proximity to Stratford Mall and the parking provided there. It's also very close to existing bus routes and a 10 minute walk to Stratford Metrolink. Officers are satisfied that the impact from the existing use to the proposed use would not result in a severe impact on the highway and free parking demand and therefore do not see this as a reason for refusal. In regards to the impact on amenity, the comings and goings to the site are not considered to be so great as to cause harm to the amenity of the adjacent residential properties. And in regards to the noise of the use, this is considered acceptable given the hours of use proposed and outlined in your conditions. Therefore, subject to the conditions outlined within your report, we do recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you. Is um, Mr. Stiles with us? Thank you for your patience, Mr. Stiles. Just have a seat opposite me. I think the microphone is on, so just make sure you're close to it. Um, and you'll have three minutes to speak to us, and we'll start the clock once you start speaking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just uh, depart from my script just to say a bit about how unsustainable this location is. Uh, the proximity of a bus stop doesn't make it sustainable. The, it's the frequency of the services that counts and that many of them are infrequent. Uh, 10 minutes walk to the metro station is a joke. Uh, it takes uh, that long to cross the Chester Road sometimes. Um, if it was a sustainable location, we wouldn't have the parking problem that has arisen since this dentist practice uh, opened. This proposal is an intensification of an existing use that has no off-street parking spaces and inadequate disabled access. The situation has arisen because the planning department failed to ensure there was the requisite 16 parking spaces with the original planning consent. This is not a highly sustainable location, as the report suggests, where parking standards can be relaxed. The report acknowledges that the site is on a trunk road across a busy junction from the town centre, making pedestrian access difficult. The nearest metro station is across two busy junctions and 800 metres away. For most users of this private dental practice, the only realistic option for most parts of the borough will be driving. We consider policy L4 should carry some weight due to the site not being a sustainable location. The existing inadequate parking provision and given the level of local opposition summarized in the representations title at the beginning of the report. The report states the expanded dental practice will require three disabled spaces, yet currently there is only one on-street disabled bay that is not exclusive to the practice. The local highway authority has not raised an objection on this basis. They consider such an objection could not be sustained at appeal. 
However, combined with the unsustainable location and current inadequate parking, residents consider there is a strong case for refusal on inadequate disabled access contrary to the officer's conclusions. The absence of off-street dedicated disabled parking does limit accessibility of the premises for some patients and is contrary to guidance in core strategy policy L7.5, NPPF and the provisions of the Equality Act 2010. This is not a sustainable location or an accessible site. Therefore, these are material considerations and there should be no NPPF presumption in favor of this proposed development. Current parking problems in the area are a direct result of the inadequate provision in early planning approvals. If this proposal is permitted, the intensified use of the site will exacerbate the parking problems that already impacts negatively on the amenity of local residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. And is uh, Jabir Diwale with us? Um, Mr. Diwale, just come and have a seat opposite uh, me and um, you're know, speaking in favour of the application. So you'll have um, th three minutes to speak to us once you start speaking. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Um, thank you very much for letting me speak this evening. Um, I'm going to be honest, I actually agree with Mr. Stiles. He does raise some valid points. There's no two ways about it. On that street, Parking is an issue, and I get that. And in all honesty, I don't know how to fix that issue per se, and residents have every right to look to their elected representatives to try and represent their interests. I think the only thing that I'd like to do this evening is just to provide a little bit of context to the parking issue right next door to our dental practice. There is an eight surgery practice that will see 20 to 30 patients per surgery every single day. And we have two surgeries. They are rarely ever in use simultaneously. And we'll see between 10 to 15 patients a day. Parking is definitely an issue. I, I don't disagree. And I don't necessarily know how to fix that issue. Um, that's, that's for you guys to decide. I'm a dentist by trade. I know what the loading time of amoxicillin is and what tertiary dentin means, but the parking issue, I can't. It, it isn't one that I can necessarily uh, help to try and fix. We, in relation to disabled access, as part of us being able to open that dental practice, um, we underwent a CQC inspection and we have got wheelchair access um, for that, for, for our dental practice. And I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. The practice next door does not. And they've had their CQC approval way before the CQC was even a thing. And I want to also say with Rio Dental, it is a private dental practice. It's by way of Google Review Metrics, the third highest rated practice in Manchester. And we're really proud of the service that we provide. Of course, Mr. Saz is right. It is a private practice. Having said that, roughly this time last week, we saw Julia's daughter was nine years old um, because her NHS dentist couldn't see her. Nobody would help her. And then we did that pro bono. And we, we don't advertise the fact that we do that because it isn't sustainable. But we do try and give back. We, we, we think we're a, a positive influence to the local community. We employ, I think just as I was coming in, I saw Academy 92, I think it's called, and someone said one of our staff members uh, is a student there. We employ people locally. And I think we're a benefit to, to essentially being there. So. Whatever decision you guys reach this evening, we'll, we'll be more than satisfied with. Uh, but I just want you to have a think about it in context. On Barton Road, as soon as you turn left, you've got 10 businesses. Not a single one of them has allocated parking spaces. And more times than not, we've actually bore the brunt of parking issues, even when the surgery hasn't been in use. We're lucky we have CCTV camera. There's photographic evidence of our staff being harassed by people saying, well, somebody's parked in my space when we haven't. And the message from us has always been the same, These, that they are our neighbors and to treat them with utmost respect. And we've never said anything in relation to that. And I thank you guys for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Dali, for coming to speak to us. Um, I think I'll just ask um, Ms. Miller for some advice on the, the previous application, um, this is addressed in the air and O. So there was a previous planning application to, to convert the, the current premises into a dental practice, but that wasn't implemented. So in fact, the change was, I think, permitted development. And I think that might have an impact here on um, 
the point that Mr. Styles raised about why didn't we insist on 16 parking spaces at that stage? Thank you. So the planning permission and uh, related to 24 and 26, and that was from 2020. In 2021, the government changed the use class order and it meant that the previous use of a hairdresser and also being a shop, previously class A, yes, it'd been a, it's it interchanged, and um, that would have been class A and it was going to a D use, but then in 2021, they both moved into the same use class E. So the planning permission, we've looked at that and we don't think it was implemented because there were a number of discrepancies between what we approved and what's currently going on site. Therefore, it is completely reasonable for officers to conclude that this use is lawful because it it wasn't a change in, in use class and therefore it could be carried out under permitted development. So the existing surgery, the change of use to the dental surgery took place under permitted development and therefore no parking was required. So they have two um, consultancy rooms currently. Um, I would draw your attention to the fact that we have restricted further changes of use within Class E. Um, class E is now um, quite an extensive um, coverage of different use classes and to um, stop further kind of changes that are unrestricted we have sought to, to restrict that. We've also in that same condition restricted the number of consultancy rooms um, at this unit to a maximum of four. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members looking to speak on this item. Councillor Akinella. Uh, I welcome the change in um, that there's going to be disabled access into the building, even though there isn't any disabled parking. And um, parking has always been an issue around that neck of the woods. Um, for those who can get across the road, like say there is Stretford um, Mall where you can park um, for free for a couple of hours. Um, I can't see all the objections seem to be about traffic and um, and that's not something we've got control of. So I personally would be proposing that we go with the officer's recommendation and agree. Thank you, Councillor Akinola. Councillor Hassan. Uh, I second the, to my colleague. Parking is a, it's a national issue and uh, and officer has just uh, given the strong uh, in regards to parking. And uh, we are getting complaints every single day is parking. And, and uh, we desperately need dentists, to be honest, uh, in that area, and particularly in the north of the borough. And uh, people every single day are struggling to go to the dentist, number one. Mm -hmm. And there are many parking places available behind the streets. I know this area very well. And, and there are bus connections. There is, the, this road is have a lot of connectivity in regards to the, uh, the bus and the tram. And of course, and uh, Trafford Council uh, now trying to enhance more and more cycling routes and the walking routes through the Trafford uh, Barrow. So I don't think there is any problem not to give this grant this application. I fully support the officer's recommendation and a second to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chair. If this, if this wasn't granted, the dentist go away, would it, would it ease in any way, shape or form any of the parking issues suffered by residents? No, it wouldn't. As a brand shop that probably had one customer a day, the, the parking issues were there. It isn't residential parking, it is on road parking. Nobody, unless there's a resident scheme, has a specific right to park outside the house. Most of us would like to. And back in the day when I was a young one, we all could because there was nowhere near as many cars on the road. That said, that's no reason for this to be uh, refused. I agree with the office completely and I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bunting. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Is there a parking issue in this area? Yeah, there is. Can it be put down to this? And indeed, the applicant, actually, refreshingly honest, uh, congratulate you on that point. He was uh, at least happy to admit that point and not try and obfuscate it in any way. And is some of it down to this institution? Yes. Is the majority of it? No. As Councillor Thomas just pointed out, if this uh, dental service, you know, gone tomorrow, would the parking issue suddenly resolve itself of course it wouldn't 
you know. So will people drive to this dental practice? Yes, they will. People generally tend to drive to that, especially if you're having dental work done, you maybe not feel so great afterwards. You're not going to want to get on the bus immediately after, if, unless you can avoid it. Will the increased parking as a result of this change be significant in any way or will it be a drop in the ocean compared to the issue that's already there yeah it it's going to be the drop isn't it so it's not going to make an appreciable difference of any significant kind that needs to yes so yes there will be some harm but that needs to be mitigated against the fact that yes facilities like this are very much required dentists are often in in short supply and uh, it's good to see the expansion of a of a facility such as this so on on the whole, I feel that the, the any harms that are done are a extremely limited and b overwhelmed by the positives that come as a result of doing of this application. So, I will be more than happy to vote in favour of officer recommendation uh, i.e. to grant. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bunting. Any other members looking to speak, Councillor Welton? Uh, yes, I'm very much in agreement with the other members. Um, I'm. Uh, Glad to see that there's going to be a travel plan submitted, and I, you know, you very much hope that they will be um, recommending to customers as to to park in the in 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 the mall, and that's the place, the place for for people to park. If the parking is as bad as people say they will, then a lot of people won't be able to park closely anyway. So hopefully they will be encouraged to uh, to go and park where there are parking facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Welton. Yeah, I think I think the main issue here is is obviously the parking and. It's not for the applicant to to fix that parking problem. I, I agree with that, and I think the the expansion creates a need for I think five or six more parking spaces. So that that's the issue here. It's those extra five or six parking spaces, which ideally would be provided. You're going to have trying to park in that area, and it, it is a problematic area. There's a lot of businesses around there, uh, and so those potentially extra five or six cars go into the site. I don't think that comes anywhere near saying it's unacceptable um, in terms of highway safety or it has a severe impact on on the road network. Appreciate what the um, what Mr. Stiles said, that it's very easy to say it's a high, highly sustainable location because it's got a bus stop there. Um, and there are difficulties crossing the road there. I'm hopeful that will change with the redevelopment of Stretford Mall and, um, you know, there will be more priority to pedestrians around that area, but I, I can't see that those parking concerns give any valid reason to to refuse planning permission uh, here. Um, so it has been moved and seconded that we um, that we grant planning permission as per officer recommendation. So we'll um, go to the vote on that now. So all those in favor of uh, granting permission, if you could indicate no, please. Okay, thank you. That is uh, unanimous. So that application is, is granted. Thank you. Um, so we will move on now. We'll just get Councillor Winston. Oh, he's here. So we'll move on now to um, uh, Bowdoin Lawn Tennis Club, application 107813, which is on page uh, one of the bundle. And we'll start with an introduction from Ms. Coley. Thank you, Chairman. The application site comprises a gravel surface car park forming part of the wider Bowdoin Lawn Tennis Club site. The site fronts Green Walk to the southwest, with the remainder of the club stretching to the northeast, and is bound by dwellings to all other sides. The site is located within Character Zone C, southern residential of the Devisdale Conservation Area, with the remainder of the tennis club site within Character Zone B. The Grade 2 listed building, Earlstein, is located to the southwest on the opposite side of the road. The, applica the applicant seeks planning permission to resurface and reconfigure the car park to install a gravel filled bod paved surface, clearly defined parking bays, two three meter high aluminium LED lighting columns, four low light level light bollards and two EV charging points. The application has been reported to the planning committee as six letters of objection have been received contrary to the officer recommendation. Given that the council's core strategy heritage policy is out of date, the tilted balance in MPPF paragraph 11D2 is engaged. The proposal is considered to be acceptable in principle, as well as with reference to a design and heritage, residential amenity, highways, parking and ecology impacts. The public benefits of the scheme would outweigh the negligible harms to the conservation area. There will be no significant light spillage into residential curtilages, and the council's nuisance consultee has no objection to the scheme. 
In terms of MPPF paragraph 11D2, it is considered that with appropriate conditions imposed, there are no adverse impacts that would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of granting planning permission. As such, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you. Uh, there are no speakers to this item, so uh, Councillor Thomas, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question. Can I confirm, that is the column height on the lamppost 2.2 or 3 metres? 3 metres. Okay. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to see, I'd, I'd prefer the 2.2 metres, to be honest, because it, it, it protects the residences um, a little bit better than, than 3 metres. I'd also like to have looked at the Glampo design, and I'd like to have seen them covered to, to force them to down lights sort of on the angle, <clears throat> which should light the uh, car park um, adequately and, and, again, offer a little bit more protection uh, to to pacify the neighbours. Um, similarly with the, the walk, which I believe I, I, I'm trying to think, has they been removed now? Yeah, yes, that was never in the application site, so that's just been removed from the scheme entirely. But I was going to say a similar thing there. Uh, hedgerows on the outside, which are outside of it, again, outside of the application, then that's a, a thing for Trafford Environmental. We should be making sure that sports club, we have the same thing with a sports club in my ward, where they get around it by saying it's the nesting season. They should be doing it just before and just after to stop pavements being done. But that's no reason to uh, to refuse. Um, I think it's it's quite sympathetic. It keeps the car park virtually the same, just with a little bit of lighting to uh, improve safety. So I'm happy to propose that we accept the officer recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Bunting. Here we are again, Chairman. How many times have you been to this site in the past? I remember, Mike, so you should join our party. Mate. Lots of applications, all of them fiercely contested, every last one of them. Here we and Yeah, so no surprise that we've got uh, in excess of set, it, it, yeah, the requisite number of objections to bring this to us. Unlike Councillor Thomas, I, I don't have such a problem with the design or the size of the, the lighting. I think they're reasonable, but that's probably a matter of, of, of judgment. I'm sure some may agree, some may disagree. I think the car, I've been through all the, for all the reasons for objection. I think it's more, I, I think the, I, I don't. I can't agree that any of them offer a substantive reason to refuse it. I think it's more a case of antagonism towards this site that is, we get the usual any you know anything you can think of to object. Uh, I, I, I've I've been through. I can't see anything that would stand up. Uh, in terms of in terms of any kind of appeal or any kind of scrutiny, uh, it's a perfectly reasonable application, and I'm more than happy to second uh, the proposal that's just been made. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wynne Stanley. Uh, thank you, Chair. I can't judge the antagonism of the the people who live around the um, who live around the club, so I won't <laughs> won't second what uh, Councillor Bunton just said. Uh, but no, I can't see any issue with this at all. It, I think it adds to the um, the facilities that are already there. I don't think it will do anything to impinge on the residents. And the bit I did like about it is there'll be additional lighting, which will. Um, extended uh, the extended hours into half 10 which will actually make the car park safer again without impinging on the residents so yeah i'm happy to support this thank you chair uh councillor chalking just picking up on that point um the obviously there's concern about the lighting and, and this has happened before on other on similar applications um more of a technical question was there any conversation with the club about switching off the columns but leaving the Ballard lights on after half nine. Um, not, not that I'm aware, aware of, Councillor. I mean, uh, was, uh, uh, there's no reason to um, hold this up, but it's, I was, it was just, I think, um, worth it's worth asking because um, I recognise why. I recognise in the report why um, we, you, you, have, you haven't um, asked for the lights to be turned off any earlier than half ten, but uh, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Chalkin. Any other members looking to speak? No, okay. It has been moved and seconded. We um, grant planning permission um, as per the officer recommendation, so we will uh, vote on that motion now. So this is to grant. So all those in favour of grant, if you could indicate no, please. And that is unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we'll move on to our last application, which is... Um, 
to George Street. So this is the former Rackham store, application uh, 110068, starting on page 95. And we'll have an introduction from Ms. Lowe's. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This application relates to the site of the former Rackham's department store and Bentley's fish and chip shop at the junction of George Street, Stamford New Road and Stamford Way in Altrincham and is sited within the Stamford Quarter Shopping Centre. Construction work is underway at the site pursuant to a previous planning permission which was granted by this committee in January 2022. The site is located within the setting of three conservation areas, George Street to the southeast, southwest, Stamford New Road to the east, old, and the Old Marketplace to the northwest. The site is also within the setting of a number of Grade 2 listed buildings. This application seeks to make various minor material amendments to the scheme, um, some changes to the internal layout and to the external elevations, and also to expand the approved uses um, within the development to include a uh, bowling alley with ancillary uses. The proposed changes to the approved plans include various external alterations to the building. This includes um, the facade reconstruction um, using a blend of reclaimed and new bricks revision and revisions to the external plant enclosure at roof level. Changes to the brick piers to make them a consistent size within the elevation and some further elevational changes to respond to internal changes on the Stamford Way facade. Changes to the approved internal layout are also proposed, including the reduction in the amount of shower facilities and cycle storage. The elevational changes are all considered to be minor and the main design intent of the development remains. The level of cycle storage and shower facilities still exceeds the council standard and this reduction is considered to be acceptable. The application also seeks to um, include the bowling alley use within the development um, at a lower ground floor unit, which was previously proposed to be a food and beverage use. This additional use is considered acceptable and a leisure and entertainment use will add to the town centre's offer, helping to improve the evening and nighttime economy in this part of Altrincham. As previously concluded, the development will result in less than substantial harm to the significance of nearby heritage assets. The level of harm identified is unchanged by these minor amendments and again it is considered that the public benefits of the scheme would outweigh the harm identified. When considering the development, the minor material amendments proposed by this application do not change the conclusions of the previously approved permission and the benefits of the scheme significantly outweigh any harm that would arise. The application is therefore rec recommended for approval and um, subject to appropriate conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lowes. Uh, no speakers on this item. Any, um, uh, Councillor Bunting? Thank you, Chairman. I won't take very long. Probably the easiest application of the evening. Nothing here causes any particular problem, just minor changes, you know. Uh, so I can't really see any object, any reason to object, and deep, there are no objections from, the, from people in the report either. So, with that said, I will just propose that we accept officer recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. Uh, Councillor Wynne Stanley. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll second that we accept officer recommendation. There's no substantive changes. It's a bowling alley instead of where else is going to go in there. It will add to the um, uh, the leisure facilities with an offering. I'm so happy to second. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wynne Stanley. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a similar mind. I'm, you know, I don't see any problem with this application. I think the design changes are largely an improvement, to be honest. Uh, it's a shame that a lot of the bricks can't be reused because I know that was one of the big benefits of the original scheme that it was going to recycle materials. Um, yeah, there's no there's no impact, no no different impact on on the heritage assets. And uh, I understand the why the cycle storage has been has been reduced because this is now part of a more self-contained development and it's still well in excess of the of the guidelines. So I'm happy to support the application as well. Uh, any other members looking to speak? No, okay. So it has been moved and seconded that we grant permission as per the recommendation. Um, so we will vote on that now, please. So all those in favour of granting, please. And that is unanimous. Thank you, everyone. So that application is approved. So that brings us to the uh, end of our applications. Um, we 
don't have any items of uh, any other business. So um, with that, we will uh, declare the meeting closed. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.